Chris's introduction. All right. I'm Laurie Perlman. Do you want to introduce me? Or no, I'm really. a clinical psychologist. Um, I've been working in the trauma field for um, a long time, actually, almost 30 years. And I worked in individual therapy for many years. And then over time, I began to feel, as the trauma field developed, I began to be sitting in my 50-minute sessions thinking at times. Thank you, sir. That's cool. Um, while in this 50 minutes, while I'm helping one person, I hope, um, how many people are being harmed who could benefit from the wealth of information that the trauma field has developed? And that work that I did first as an individual therapist and um, doing lots of other things related to trauma over those almost 20 years was at the Traumatic Stress Institute. And my group work uh, which was work that I have been doing for the last 12 years or so in Rwanda with Irvin Stau, my colleague who's here today, and in uh, Burundi and Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo, um, forms the experience base for this work. I've also had occasion this year to visit Cambodia and Bosnia, and those experiences also have informed what I'm about to talk about. Um, the moral dimensions of the work, I've been thinking increasingly about that, and, uh, well, I'll say more about that when I get there. So, all right, so what are the effects of genocide and other mass violence? Families and communities are devastated. The physical infrastructure is often destroyed. There's enormous social disruption and profound psychological and spiritual damage. And I am going to talk about that in these three groups, psychological trauma, traumatic bereavement, and psychological woundedness. So what are some of the possible effects of collective violence on individuals? Well, you all know about PTSD. I laid out the criteria for complex trauma in case you don't know them. And what I'd like to highlight there, there is that in some other cultures, somatic representations of psychological difficulties are more common than they are in our society. Although, I think they also happen to be fairly common in our society. It's just that we don't as often make the link. Um, and I always want to, when we're working in different cultures, I always want to mention culturally specific expressions. And those are things to be discovered. Those are things that you, you may not even recognize them, but the people who live there in that country, in that place, will and can help you figure that out. Um, now, what are the sources of bereavement? So that was psychological trauma, and now I want to talk about bereavement. Well, there are enormous losses, of course, that follow group violence. Psychosocial losses, the loss of infrastructure, other physical losses, and I think among the most important are spiritual losses, the loss of meaning and hope, which leads people to ask questions like, why did this happen? Why did it happen to us? There must be something wrong with us. Did God choose us to receive this punishment? And again, culturally specific losses that have to be um, understood. So those were sources of trauma. What do I mean by traumatic? Whoops, go back, go back. Okay. But what do I mean by traumatic bereavement? Uh, my colleagues and I named at the bottom are working on a book on uh, traumatic bereavement. What we mean by that is the chronic problematic reactions to the sudden death of an important person through shocking circumstances. And nothing fits that description more than group violence. Um, the responses are problematic to the extent that they interfere with the survivor's ability to meet his or her needs constructively and to live a fulfilling life. And the symptoms are trauma symptoms and grief. And psychological woundedness is another um, problem. Oh my gosh. You know, the animation thing, I just went crazy. What can I say? Um, this psychological woundedness affects many, if not most, of the people in a society where there has been group violence. And by this I mean problems that don't rise to the level of trauma, but that absolutely interfere with people's ability to get on with their lives. So disrupted frame of reference, a loss of connection to and compassion for both us and them. What I mean by that is I have been through this horrible experience. I no longer feel like I'm part of my community. I certainly don't feel like the group that harmed my group if I'm the victimized group, 
or those people we tried to get rid of but didn't succeed in getting rid of, if I'm a member of the harm doer group, I certainly don't feel connected to them. But both doing violent acts and being the victim of violent acts is very isolating oftentimes. Well, there's more to it than that, which we can discuss. I'm going to leave some time for discussion at the end. The loss of dignity, very important, and this has to be restored. And again, culturally specific expressions. What are some of the signs and symptoms of, okay, uh, of these problems that arise after uh, group violence? Tra the trauma symptoms, you know, I mentioned them. The grief symptoms. And then I would like to add important other symptoms that you know can be part of trauma and grief, but seem worth highlighting. Denial, this didn't happen, this wasn't as bad as it seems, or uh, more often, I'm okay, I'm functioning fine. The kind of people's inability to see or accept, and certainly to come to terms with what has happened to them. Fear, of course, is really huge after violence because there's no security left. There's often not physical safety, nor is there a psychological sense of security. Relationship difficulties, alienation, aggression, depression, mobilization, cynicism. So these are some of the problems that arise. So what is required for recovery? Now, when I'm using now the word traumatic bereavement, I'm including trauma and grief. What is required for recovery from traumatic bereavement and psychological wounds? These are four processes, building or rebuilding a strong foundation. And that, I didn't write it there, but it also includes a physical infrastructure. When people lose their homes, that has huge psychological effects. When, so homes have to be rebuilt, schools, places of worship. These things are really essential an essential part of psychological recovery. <clears throat> Processing traumatic memories here, I mean telling the story uh, in some way, creating a narrative, exposure of some sort, and I think that's important both for reducing fear and making meaning. And mourning losses is a process of recognizing what was lost, um, telling stories to recollect the deceased, and other losses, um, using ceremonies to move forward constructively, and um, by developing a life worth living, there are, I mean a lot of things. It's about meaning, it's about hope, it's about community. So naturally, being a co-author of the Risk and Connection Trauma Training Curriculum, I think that the path to recovery from trauma at every level is rich relationships. Rich is an acronym for Respect, Information, Connection, and Hope. And what I like about this, as we've used it in Rwanda, in East Africa, is these are general enough principles to apply in any culture because the specifics of them can be developed within each group and culture where they apply. Everybody wants and needs respect all over the world. Everybody needs information, connection, and hope. And so here is kind of a, an easy way for people to have a framework for thinking through what might help. So we're going to look at that in more detail. What do individuals need after group violence? You all know all of this. I got this thing wrong about changing the pages, huh? Okay. Symptom relief, of course. Restoration, I mean, I say of course, like check, that's done, okay? We all know that can take an enormous amount of time and effort. It's not my focus today. I assume there's a lot of expertise about that in this room and of course in the field. Um, although, well, I'll give my political speech about individual treatment in a few moments. Um, restoration of dignity, that can come about through justice and empowerment in recovery processes. Rebuilding relationships and community. Focusing on identity and morality, attending to meaning and hope and community recovery, which is where we're going. So why community interventions? I'm going to wait till my slide does its thing and then I can come back. You know, I'll start at the bottom, at near the bottom. I think that collective recovery is the most efficient use of scarce resources. I also think there is a problem when a lot of trained individual therapists rush into a culture with which we may be unfamiliar and start doing therapy. It's not, I'm not saying that there's no need for that kind of assistance. There absolutely is an enormous need for it. 
And some organizations like MDRIA, the MDR organization, are working to figure out how to do that in a culturally sensitive way, training local people, for example, to do these interventions. It's not where I personally think the action is. I think it's important, and again, it's often the one person at a time approach when you often have hundreds, thousands of people who have been um, harmed. In my view, community violence, which results in collective injuries, requires collective interventions. And I don't mean by that individual work in groups. I'm not talking about, you know, group therapy. Um, I also prefer a community or um, community psychology approach because I think a clinical approach pathologizes people. These people, as we all know, as trauma people, there's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with the people who did the bad thing to them, and there's something wrong with the bad thing that was done. So by clinicalizing, we can disempower people. Of course, it's not our intention, but it can happen. And so I think that community approaches, uh, we're just on more solid ground. Um, <clears throat> The effects of mass violence, again, I'm talking about reaching the largest group of people who are those with psychological wounds. That's the largest group. The traumatic bereavement group is smaller. I'm not saying it's small, but it is smaller. And those with severe effects, it's the smallest group. It's the group in greatest need of the kind of trauma treatment that we figured out how to do over the last 20 years. So there's room for everybody to do the kind of work he or she knows how to do. So what do communities need to recover from traumatic bereavement after group violence? Well, yes, rich relationships, of course. And here are some examples of what I mean by that. Respect can be shown by establishing security, restoring choice and control, receiving acknowledgement of harm. Is there any way to stop this? You know, it's like the inevitable crushing, moving forward of the animation out of control. It's sort of like group violence if you think about it. Okay. Um, engaging in justice processes, and I will say that oh my gosh, that um, I'll tell you what I'm going to say in a minute as soon as that comes back up on the slide. Here we go. Receiving acknowledgement of, of harm is very important for people. Of course, the people who have been harmed want that acknowledgement from the harm doers. Often, that is not forthcoming. Other people can provide acknowledgement, and that's a hugely valuable role, especially for outsiders, for people like us who come in to help. What, ex what happened to you is terrible, and it should not have happened. We're just going to go through this again and again here. Oh, good. Information, learning about what happened. If, if you're in a place where you don't have access to news, or the news you have access to is not provided by the people who would be telling you everything you should know. And, and also, everything's not on the news. You need to learn as much as you can about what actually happened. Um, developing an inclusive narrative of the conflict, I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Understanding the origins of mass violence and genocide and paths to healing. This is the work uh, Irvin and I have been doing in East Africa for the last decade or so. And we have found this enormously helpful in our um, public education radio programs in East Africa. One of the things we're doing is providing uh, entertainment, education entertainment programs, radio programs, so like soap operas, with educational message embedded, messages embedded. And um, the messages from Irvin's work are the messages about the origins and prevention of group violence. And people have found this, reported finding this enormously helpful. That's where in a workshop a woman said, you mean, this means this happened in other places? People in Rwanda, which is not a highly literate culture, more so now than it was 10, 15 years ago, but not, not, still not fully literate, um, didn't, some people in our workshops did not know that there had been genocides in other places. So um, to think that this happened to other people helped people to feel like they were not uniquely uh, identify for this kind of harm. Connection, building internal connections, by that I mean um, people connecting their thoughts and their feelings, the past and the present, what they did or didn't do with what they felt, with what they could do, with what was going on around them. Uh, again, you know, dissociation, if we think about it broadly, means just the disconnection of things in our, in our experience and in our minds. And dissociation is a very 
understandable natural response to violence and victimization. So beginning to help people put together these connections. Rebuilding interpersonal connections can be challenging, means building safety and trust. And rebuilding community, I'll talk about shortly. Hope, absolutely essential, and I think this often has to do with looking ahead to the future. So what are some healing processes that are built on the rich principles? Rebuilding infrastructure, I mentioned earlier, extremely important. Building and restoring a positive group identity. So a victimized group, just like an individual victim or survivor, often feels shame. There must be something wrong with me, even if I know that the person or people or group that harmed me is in the wrong. For whatever psychological reasons, and maybe this is, could be somebody's, maybe somebody's already done research on this, why victimized people feel shame. And it has to do, I think, with feeling responsibility, with wishing one could have made this bad thing not happen, and then that kind of gets transformed into thinking you could have or should have. It's very complex. But somehow the group needs to recover from that, and that's in part a process now of reasserting control, regaining choice, and participating in building a, a collective identity that is positive. So we're no longer only victims. We're not even only survivors. We are a people who engage constructively in the world. Recreating an atmosphere of mutual assistance. You know, trauma tends to focus people inward, so helping people begin to look outward and see that they can help each other. One of the messages in our radio project is neighbors can help neighbors heal. And that's, those of you who've worked with out in the field and doing the kind of work I'm talking about, or in group therapy, have seen the magic of that. When people realize they have something to offer to others, even though they themselves are deeply wounded, it's a huge psychological step forward. Um, seeking acknowledgement, I mentioned, and often people seek acknowledgement. You know, the Armenians have sought acknowledgement from the Turks for a century now, and it's not been forthcoming. And it's not to say that it's not due, but one has to decide, is that how you want to spend your life, your time on this earth? And yes, maybe it is, and maybe it can be broader than that. Maybe there are other processes or other places to look for acknowledgement where it might be forthcoming. Building civil society means developing institutions um, to, again, rebuild and recreate what's valuable and important in society. Participating in justice processes, very important for survivors to feel that justice processes are underway. Now, sometimes they take too long, people start to feel angry and dissatisfied, or you know, only one or two of the big perpetrators are accused, tried, found guilty, and that can feel like, what about those other hundreds of people who participated? So. Uh, not always satisfying, the same as for our individual clients, but important nonetheless. Here is a continuation of that list. Uh, focusing on youth, very important. These are the people who are going to carry the society forward, so uh, it's easy for the adults to forget about them, think they were too young for it to matter to them. Absolutely not. No matter how young they were when the bad stuff happened, they have to be part of the restoration process. Engaging people's creativity. Again, I think creativity often shuts down when people are traumatized and are in survival mode. And so finding ways to help people nurture and restore their creativity, very uh, valuable. And focusing on harm doers in a positive way is also very important. Often in these processes of group violence, it's, it's groups who are harming other groups. So there are lots of people in the society who participated in the bad stuff that happened, that's a technical term, bad stuff, or who uh, were complicit in the sense that they were bystanders and did not say no, they did not intervene if they might have had that opportunity. So these people have to somehow also be brought back into the society. They need to heal. You cannot kill other people without being injured yourself, psychologically and spiritually. They need to heal, they need to be reintegrated. In many societies, as in Rwanda, people are still living side by side to some extent in Bosnia and other places also. Um, and you know, Cambodia, people are still living together. 
Um, and connecting across group lines is very useful in, as a restorative process. So it means helping people to integrate again, so that, or, or maybe for the first time. This is not easy because there's a lot of uh, understanding and reluctance to engage with people who are different, especially if the guys and gals who tried to harm you were different from you. So I don't want to be part of the them, and I certainly don't want them being part of us. But these us-them distinctions are a huge part of what lays the groundwork for group violence. And um, significant collaborative projects, I think this is the place that I was going to tell you what I mean by that. A little, I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, no, I'm going to give you my examples in my next set of slides. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so here I was thinking about <clears throat> interdependence in projects that matter, and this is something that Urban Stout has talked about in his work, um, some other people as well, and these ideally can be projects that enhance safety. So for example, I think of uh, Michael Wessel's work in, um, I think this is, I'm not sure if the, where he did this work actually, maybe in Angola. Uh, he and his colleagues uh, introduced a process where they went into a community, asked people what their main problems were in their daily lives, and for example, one group identified that when young girls went to get water, they were often raped. Now this is, I'm not talking about this as an act of war, that's what's going on in uh, refugee camps, for example, in Congo now. I'm talking about this in a post-conflict setting. These young girls were being raped by men in their own group, in their own community. So the community group whom they were working with decided to develop a new system, bring the well closer, provide buddy, a buddy system so that a man and a girl went together to get the water. And they saw, the, the Westerners did not come in and say, here's the problem and here's the solution. They said, why don't you guys want to talk about some problems? Yeah, so people named problems. And they said, you want to talk about some solutions? They named some solutions. The group decided, what's the problem, what's the solution? <coughs> Implemented it successfully. So these are, Projects that matter to everyone, um, income generating projects, that's another type of thing that can create deep engagement. Dialogue among all parties, it means people talking to each other and talking to each other about the bad stuff that happened. And talking across groups is not always easy, but can be moved to gradually. There also, uh, to engage creativity, there are projects where, for example, small groups could develop and then produce for each other plays with messages of recovery. We found in Rwanda people were very eager to engage in role plays, and they were fantastic at doing role plays. We actually learned far more about the culture through the role plays, I think, than any other aspect. When we were, before the radio project, we were doing workshops, and uh, these plays were wonderful. Well, that tool could be used across groups for people to show people of the other group what we experienced and can be a foundation for dialogue or not. They can serve their own purposes. Maybe the dialogue comes then, maybe it comes later. Music festivals, again, engaging creativity. It juices people up, it loosens them up, it helps them come back to a broader sense of themselves inviting people to develop songs that include themes of healing and new <coughs> poetry contests, same kind of thing you could do. Um, the rescuers exhibit, uh, that it, there is a rescuers exhibit that a group called Proof has developed. Um, this woman, Leora Khan, uh, created this project, I believe it was her idea, and she uh, collaborated with photographers in these four countries, these related to these four uh, genocides, and put up a fabulous photo exhibit with pictures of the people who had rescued others and their stories. And then the exhibit is traveling around to those countries, and along with the exhibit, they're doing conferences for youth. So that's how I happened to be in Bosnia a few weeks ago at one of these proof conferences. So there were 120 young people, uh, about 60 from Sarajevo and about 60 from other places, mainly from the region, but some international. And the opening of the photo exhibit was the kickoff for the project, for the conference rather. 
So here were young people looking at the possibilities for hope and talking to each other. Uh, film project, oh, I'll go back to that. This is an interesting thing that a group called Internews did in Rwanda. They uh, took a some sort of mobile, you know, news movie photography thing with them. You can see my technical skills coming through yet again. <laughs> and they went into communities and they uh, started dialogue between and among people. And they filmed the dialogues. And then they put that show on the road. They took that film to the next community. And they showed that film. And then they got the people in the next community to talk about what they had just witnessed. Well, I don't agree with what those people said about blah, blah, or what he said, or this and that. And they filmed that. And they kept building this and taking it around to more and more places. Of course, editing it. Otherwise, it would have been rather long. But it was a way for people in a, in a country where there's not a lot of communication across villages to see what was going on in other villages. And also, a way of putting the issues out there so that people didn't have to start by talking to those who had harmed them. They could all talk about those people in the film. As I said, dialogue among hostile parties doesn't have to be the first step, but it's a way to open it up. <clears throat> Developing an inclusive history, very difficult, but it has to be done if you're going to teach your kids anything in the schools. And in fact, we just had a very interesting uh, I heard a very interesting comment in Sarajevo a couple of weeks ago. A young woman in the group said that she, when she got to college, she was Serbian, and when she got to college, she learned for the first time that the school system in um, the school system in Bosnia is in and in much of the region is separated, so that kids from different ethnic groups go to different schools or the same school at different times. They're not integrated. So this young woman said. When she got to college, she learned for the first time that the kids in the Muslim schools were being taught a different version of history than the kids in the Serbian schools. This is a problem. This is a serious problem. So of course, everybody's version of history is different. They started it as usually the foundation for the difference. And uh, I think an inclusive history means, this. Is, by the way, this point comes from Urban Style. It's one of his points about recovering from group violence. But I think an inclusive history means a history that includes both of those perspectives. It doesn't have to be that we're going to do mine or yours, because you're never going to get there. That's never going to happen in a peaceful, productive way. So somehow, all the different perspectives have to be represented. I mentioned ceremonies earlier. These are very important uh, and need to be done in a way that doesn't reignite conflict, but that acknowledges that we've all lost something, and we can all move forward together constructively. I mentioned our radio programs. We can talk about that more in our discussion if you're interested. <clears throat> um, so in my view, this community level recovery augments and enhances individual recovery. It's not instead of. And of course, individual recovery contributes to collective or community recovery. Now I want to shift to talking about the morality of these interventions. Um, first, to say what I mean when I use the term morality, this is my own distinction. There probably are other, in fact, I know there are other distinctions and ways people draw the lines of what does it mean, but in my view, ethics is a system of principles that govern appropriate behavior, usually codified. So we have our ethical principles as psychologists, for example. By morality, I mean something a little bit uh, more fluid, I guess, a dynamic relationship with principles and virtues reflected in the beliefs and behaviors that affect others' welfare. So I think that while ethics are the rules governing relationships, I still think of morality as a more relational kind of um, uh, issue. So that's where my starting point is. It's really very important for us to think about the moral implications of all the work we do whether individual or collective. And these principles I'm about to list, of course, apply to us as individual, doing our individual work as well as our group and collective work. Working within one's, I'm, I'm going to just, uh, I think I have time, to put these up and then I'm gonna talk about each one very briefly. All right. <clears throat> Working within our areas of expertise, 
no, I don't want to do this. I want to go through these one by one. I'm not even going to read this list. Okay, we'll go one by one. So I put together the first two, working within areas of expertise and uh, uh, cultural competence. Is that true? No, I have to go back and see what I wrote. Yes. So here, developing expertise, of course, is done through training, collaboration, supervision, consultation, and cultural competence. I'm putting here under developing an awareness of what one does and does not know. There's a lot to learn when you're working in another culture, and part of the problem is you don't know what you don't know. And so we have to start in sort of a mentoring or um, process, collaborative process, where we're working with people of the culture who have experience and expertise there, who know what's going on there. Otherwise, we won't even know when we're messing up what we don't know. Um, what are the typical responses to violence and loss? What are local healing practices? And our areas of expertise here include community-level trauma work and international work. Here, I think our best bet is to have partners, and mentors, and uh, this takes time. This takes a lot of time to develop. It doesn't mean stay home until you know what you're doing, but it means, and, and also I want to say about expertise, it's really important not to let go of what you do know, okay? So the situations are often very evocative. It's easy to show up in a new culture and feel like I know nothing. That's also not true. You still know what you know, so we have to find that place where we hold on to what we do know, and we hold it with humility. We're very open to learning that there's a lot we don't know. Um, all right, okay, developing cultural competence. So ask, don't tell, um, partnership, part shared participation. By sustainability, I'll just say another word about that. I mean, trying to create projects that will last after you're gone. I don't mean gone permanently, but gone from that place, and or, and sustainable for yourself. It's also very easy to be drawn into doing too much. Now this I think is true with trauma survivor work generally. There's such a feeling of the depth of the need and a yearning to make it have never happened or do everything and more than everything to uh, undo it or redo it, and we can easily find ourselves uh, doing more than we're actually able to sustain. In terms of managing frame and boundaries, um, developing and sustaining role clarity, what is it that you're there to do? What can you really do? And uh, in the time that you have and within your areas of expertise. So when we were in Rwanda, a lot of people asked us, people asked for money, um, people asked for, when I was in Kenya, a woman asked me for my shoes. They weren't even terrific shoes, but I had shoes and she didn't. Um, and everybody we ever met in Rwanda, I will say, okay, 99% of people we ever met in Rwanda asked us, can you help me, my child, my friend, get into school in America? And absolutely an understandable wish. I went to school in America and it worked for me, so I couldn't possibly imagine that that would be something not valuable to someone else. And it's not something I have any idea how to do. So I was in a position of constantly disappointing everybody I met, which we all know doesn't feel that good. Um, leads to a lot of personal reflections. And I think here the moral issue becomes, what is it that I can give? And am I giving? everything I can give, and am I accepting the limitations of what I can give? And these are really rough questions to struggle with, and they take time and attention. Um, I think that's part of what, what I mean by managing expectations. Uh, maintaining confidentiality, very challenging in field work. Often your collaborators may not be psychologists, they may not have the expectation that you know we're, we should be attending to what these people are telling us as if it were a confidential communication. And yet, it's very important to respect everybody's privacy, confidentiality boundaries, and uh, to resist the pulls, which I think often arise within ourselves 
from countertransference and vicarious trauma to tell everything. You're going to be filled up with what you've witnessed. How can you not tell everything? So, of course, you need to find professional uh, forums where you can tell everything, just as we do in our individual work. That's what individual consultation is for, which we should all be getting all the time throughout our professional careers, no matter how much experience we have. All right, exerting moral influence. Now, this is kind of a controversial thing to say, so I thought I would say this. Um, the work should be built on values, of course, but whose values, right? Ours as psychologists, as Westerners, if that's who we are, as uh, individuals, as whatever, the values of the people who have been harmed, the values of their broader culture. This, there's no answer. I'm not going to give you the answer on the next slide. This is a dialogue within yourself and between yourself and the people you're working with. What I'm doing is raising issues for awareness. Encouraging your colleagues to do the right thing. This refers to confidentiality, managing expectations, setting boundaries, um, paying attention to values, and inviting participants to consider their behavior toward others. I'll say about this, um, this is a tough one. What I mean by this is, Many people have engaged in behaviors that are less than lovely. And this is, of course, true in individual therapy. If you think about your, for example, I worked a lot with childhood, uh, adult survivors of childhood abuse and neglect. And some of my clients had done things to their younger siblings, to their pets, and so on, which would come out over time if I created an atmosphere of trust and respect and security in the therapy relationship in collaboration with my client. And I think it's the same when we're intervening in groups. To make space for people to talk about the bad things they did means that you have to keep in your mind at all times, whomever you're talking to, that person might also have done some bad things that he or she feels bad about. So how will it be possible for that person to talk about that? And then how will you respond? And I think it's important not to respond with, oh, that's okay, but rather to respond in a way that helps people examine what they did and why they did it. Not in a judgmental way, but gives people space, because otherwise it's disingenuous and I don't think we're doing anybody any favors on a moral uh, level or, or a social level. Uh, okay, oh look, they're just coming one at a time, how exciting. All right. And the last moral principle I'm going to uh, discuss is uh, countertransference arises. We all have feelings about violence and uh, victimization and trauma. You will have responses to the people you're working with and the culture you're working in. So these, again, are issues for awareness. Vicarious trauma in response to the work over time. Certainly, I experienced this in my work in Rwanda in the early years. I I start to struggle with, um, why am I doing this? Is it making any difference? Could someone else do it better? Should I be doing it differently? Should I do more? Should I do less? Um, why bother? Maybe, I, maybe it's me. Maybe I should stay home. And, um, and these, were, these are not just the names for feelings, although they were also that, but issues that I had to grapple with and kind of came to work on what is the meaning of the work I'm doing. And of course, for me, given that my life has been very much built around my work. It was a core identity issue. So if my work is not meaningful, is my life meaningful? So I went through a real existential struggle. And ultimately, that was a good process. But uh, it definitely grew out of vicarious trauma. It led to kind of a vicarious, what I call a vicarious transformation. Um, and also, your colleagues may or may not be aware of these processes, countertransference and vicarious trauma. And I think it's very valuable to keep the team you're working with, both the nationals and the internationals, uh, aware of that and talking about it. And I think the simple antidote to vicarious trauma is awareness, balance, and connection. Now, I am going to stop here. No, I have one more slide I really want to show you. OK. What is needed now? New models. How can we use our rich, with a lowercase r, Clinical, clinical, theoretical, and research experience space to create new ways of addressing collective trauma, bereavement, and woundedness. 
This is sorely needed, and we need new models and new research to test those models, and in ways to integrate whatever comes from that, the positive findings into practice. I think Division 56, our trauma, wonderful trauma division, would be great if we had an interest group or a whatever forum we might have, and thank you, I don't actually want to. <laughs> thank you, Chris, I could already see that question forming in your mind. <laughs> but somebody, half my age, should do this to develop these models. So that's, I think, where I'm going to leave things. So we have, I think, just a few minutes left, but I'd like to have some, some conversation if people have questions you'd like to ask. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. I want to thank you for uh, your level of humility in doing the work that you do in Rwanda because it makes me crazy to see all these Western um, psychologists and mental health people uh, they come with their arrogance and, and uh, you have to have that level of humility to truly be culturally competent. And so I want to thank you. It's, it's not uh, typical to see that in a person of your talent. Um, and I also happen, I, I have a question, it's very personal. I happen to be in Norway when this bombing and killing happened. Um, and I was watching, as a trauma psychologist, I was watching what was uh, transpiring there, and the uh, Norwegian people reaction, and I walked with them in the vigils, and, and et cetera. But, and I thought it was interesting that they were um, not used to that level of violence, although Laura Brown reminded me that there was a Nazi occupation there. But uh, I was wondering, what would you tell them if you were the expert coming here, they hired you, um, considering the context of Norway and the lack of violence there, and uh, what would you tell them in terms of recovery? Well, I, so the question is, what what would I tell people in Norway about recovery from this uh, yeah, terrible? considering that it's a country that has in a pacifist country. Yeah. You know, I think I'd want to start by asking people, of course, asking people, you know, what do you what do you understand about what happened and why, and what do you need now? I think the, the approach is to try to, you know, get whatever, like focus groups, essentially, to ask people, what do you need now? And then to support people in uh, re resilience building processes, basically, very foundational, like psychological first aid, you know, resilience building processes with the assumption that the society is going to do a certain amount of healing on its own without any kind of intervention over some period of time. And and then I think, you know, what's what I understand from my one Norwegian friend, uh, <laughs> the representative of the entire nation, um, is that uh, of course, there's this wonderful feeling now of we are all one and we're not going to let this kind of thing mean that you know we, we're two different groups and we can't stand immigrants and absolutely that's not going to happen. Well, does anybody here remember 9-11? And we were all one then too, right? And not so much anymore. And so I think what I'd like to be able to do is to share our experience from 9-11 and to say, you know, after something like this happens, an attack in which somebody identifies, I'm doing this basically because I'm a right-wing not case, I don't think those were his exact words, but something to that effect, um, that it, doesn't, it means that there are rifts in the society, perhaps, that need to be examined, and that there needs to be dialogue among these groups. So maybe it's a time for us as a country, for you as a country, for us, I think it was, it is now in the US also, to talk to each other about the issues that this sadly points out. Thank you. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Okay. Oh, one more question. One more question. Um, to tell you quickly where my question is coming from, I'm a director of an outpatient mental health clinic in Brooklyn. Um, so as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking about my clients. And so a lot of my clients have identified or quickly identified individual or relational traumas, but they also often have taken place within a social context that's disaffirming and unsafe. I'm wondering how your work on group violence and especially international work has changed or informed your thinking about working with individuals or smaller groups in trauma therapy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, trauma itself, it, it, the PTSD concept is based in an understanding that there's something bigger going on. And so I think for me, it's been a really important reminder that the people we're treating in our individual therapy 
relationships live in a much broader context. It's actually this lady here who should be answering this question, Dr. Sandy Bloom. You know, for us to keep remembering that, yes, she had this awful thing happen, and he, blah, blah, and what was the context? And I think we often guide people to look at the family context, and we also need to invite them to look at the broader social and political context. And we need to acknowledge that, to learn about it from them, and to acknowledge that that's part of what's happening for you. This isn't only about you, and it's not even only about you and your family, for example. It's a bigger picture. Sandy has a great slide about this. It's all, Sandy, but it's probably on this computer. All right, so I will stop now and let Chris give her announcements. Thank you very much. Thank you.